nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Well, I can. <laughs> Does he have a record that I can check him for felony? Yeah, so he's one like at that? all. <laughs> you, you, you know the difference between Lonnie, yeah. help me out with the background checks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, in good hands. Yeah. You sure he qualifies to do that? <laughs> okay. All right. Further discussion. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. All right. Accept resignation of Amy. Is it Amy? Okay. Bus driver. Yeah. McGee. I move that the board approve the resignation of Amy McGee as bus driver. I'll second it. The only thing I bring up, you know, if she wants to be a backup, so does Amber. That's that backup. I think there's seven. So we'll have two. That's a good thing to have. Eddie will be happy. Did we get a second? Yeah. Okay. Further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Um, those opposed? All right, item six, public comment. We have one, that would be Chris Starman, NYC School. Yeah, I just wanted to give kind of a perspective from a, a non-school faculty member um, employee out of the camp. I, um, I kind of wear a hat of, of responsibility around performance outcomes and we solicit information from the school all year long in terms of test scores and GED um, success rates and diplomas that are received and whatnot. And I was going through <clears throat> some of the exit interviews. We conduct an exit interview on every kid that leaves our facility. And it asks a lot, about, a lot of questions about preparation for the next step in their life. And uh, one of the questions is, is what's the best thing that happened to you while you were at the NACEL youth camp? And, and one of the comments that struck me today was um, the youth said, the best thing that happened to me was improving my test scores three grades in two months. So the youth scored at a particular rate and then two months later, and this is kind of the quick turnaround that we experienced with some of these kids, they've improved their test scores three grades worth. And uh, I guess I just want to speak to kind of the private lease that I have. Um, as kind of a stakeholder of the school out there, the faculty every day I come into that school, um, and the kids that they have to, to, uh, to deal with every day, they just seem to do a great job. They always have smiles on their faces. A lot of the things they have to say um, exemplify their commitment to the kids, and I think it just pays off, and um, I just, I'm just kind of here to report that everything just seems like a really stable, healthy ship at the youth camp in terms of the school. Um, and, and that's a great thing, and it's showing in our, our test scores, and it seems to be more commonplace, the information I'm getting from Norlin Packenden, um, lots of improvements in test scores, so just kind of um, want to share that success that they're having out there. And the JRA has noted any of this? Have they paid attention to any of this? Yeah, it, you know, and there's a lot of, I mean, OSPI is kind of involved, they have a a partnership with JRA in terms of soliciting test scores because they're taking a look at things that way too. And there's a lot of agendas out there like disproportionate minority contact type agendas where they're looking at you know cultures and ethnic backgrounds and test scores and disproportionate um, you know confinement and issues like that. So I mean JRA takes a look at that and I do the best that at least I can in, in the position that I'm in to share that information with JRA as a system in terms of the success that we're having, but I don't think that it's, I don't think it's any hidden secret that we, we have a huge amount of success given the narrow window of time that we have to work with these kids. And I, and I, would, I would go to bat any single day to say that we are the best. Um, well, I guess my next question is, do yeah. you think it's having an impact with JR? Sure, I, I, I think so. Uh, I have my own opinions or even worse yet maybe some judgments that there's just so many agendas and politics out there that are being played at a much higher level than we have control over. All we have control over is the performance at our facility and I think it makes it really difficult when we have the backing of legislative staff um, you know that are in our areas and we're showing the data that supports how well we do with kids. Um, I think that that's what kind of keeps like a, a shield around us and keeps us protected and keeps us you know, available to do the work that we're charged to do, so. 
I agree with you. The legislators are doing a good job. They are. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what would prevent, I, I assume there's something that could prevent incorporating uh, some of those uh, students into our sports program. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, the thing is, is in the continuum of care with JRA, we have institutions where you start their commitment for the crime they've committed, and then they transition many of them onto group homes or community facilities, of which some, um, or in fact, most of them have contracts with local school districts whereby which the youth that they have enough time at those community facilities can actually attend those high schools in that community. So for instance, uh, Canyon View Group Home, which is primarily a drug and alcohol aftercare facility in Wenatchee, actually has, um, I think it's East Douglas, I can't remember the exact high school, but the kids go to the high school there and some of them play sports. I know that in Woodenville, um, I just recently heard in the last six months about a kid that made the varsity team for the Woodenville football team. And if you know the size of the school that you're dealing with up there, 4A, um, you're talking about a lot of kids and a lot of kids that are trying to make varsity. So that's quite a, an accomplishment by that youth. So um, I've always made the joke that you know we should create a group home at the fish hatchery that can sustain the fish hatchery. We can have the kids going to school here, participating in athletics and everything. Um, I'd love to think that that could come to pass, but it would take a lot of work and uh, a lot of arguing. Another big deterrent is the average length of stay is 69.9 days. So that's tough. Craig, I'm not from China. No, that we had kids from Windy Valley um, when I was in school. And, and I remember a couple of them were not bad athletes. Well, Lisa and I sit at the same meeting every Thursday and we look at some of the profiles of these kids and linebacker, fullback, yeah. you know, center forward. For <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions for Chris? Okay, we're going to move on to item seven, unfinished business, second reading board policies. Uh, 3226, 3246, and 4310. Okay, so these are the ones actually that were approved this time. They sent us many, many ones, but these are the ones we go into in detail. Um, so this one is interviews and interrogations of students on school premises. Um, just kind of a summary here. That does happen on occasion. We make every effort we can to not have those interviews that occur on campus. There are times that sometimes it is unavoidable or this may be the best place to talk to a child, especially if maybe the investigation involves a home situation. Um, Lisa, I've got a quick question on that. Mm -hmm. Do superintendents ever establish protocols? We have protocols. Do we? Yeah. Do we have them already? So the parents do get notified when they come in. Karen and John can probably elaborate a little bit further. But, um, yeah, private room for interviews. How often do they actually come here? We try to deter them as much as possible. Sometimes it's home visits. But they usually don't apply to parents. Right. And we don't want to get in a situation with the parent where we kind of, here, here's the key, you know, turn the kid over to the people to be interviewed without the parent presence. So that's you know, one of the procedures is the parent phone call if the parents aren't already involved. In Situation. Yeah, that one. Um, mm -hmm. Isolation force. Uh, use of isolation restraint, restraint devices, and reasonable force. This is rare, but there are occasions where we would call it at the camp, but we would call it a handling, but where students are physically restrained. Um, you know, it's obviously not the first priority, but if there is a chance that you know, equipment or other individuals can um, occur and you've already tried your de-escalation, then you may use reasonable force, but it's pretty much a last resort. They talk about restraint devices. So chemical spray is reasonable only under those situations we talked about. Um, if the kid's starting for class, we obviously don't mace them or put restraints on them. But um, there are 
some students, especially students with disabilities, at times, you know, according to their IEP, may have situations where they are restrained. So you know, have a policy for that. It becomes a severe enough issue. And this follows also for the, the camp? Does this policy follow? These are specific public school policies. The camp has its own set of policies around use of okay. uh, force uh, restraints, or some handcuffs, um, takedowns, I guess, for lack of a better term. Are those, um, who reviews those policies? Uh, those are JRA, JRA. JRA. Yeah. handed down to the school. But typically, while my staff does work there, you know, they like us to fall under their policies, but we're really two distinct entities. My staff are instructed not to get involved in physical altercations because they haven't had that specific level of training that the JRA folks have had. Our teacher's job is really, when their fight breaks out, is to keep the other kids out of the fight and not turn their back on the other 12. So their job is more crowd control, keep the other kids out of the way because when backup comes running, we don't want our teacher in the middle of the doorway. But it's, it's a pretty clear system of how it works when something goes on down there. It's different. Have we ever had a report, annual report on the board and the use of force? <laughs> I know it's probably not hardly ever done here. It's pretty right limited. Um, I don't think it's collected through OSPI. It's not something we fill out like on a regular basis. We have to do it on an incident. Well, I mean, it says they're going to go back annually. The superintendent's supposed to report to the board on the use of force. I mean, I don't know how you keep track of all these things. You wouldn't have time in, you know, in the day to do half the things that are in these things. That's my thinking, but if there was a situation like that, we would let you know. Because, oh, sure. You know, yeah. We would report that. Uh, probably would call you rather than wait for months to tell you, you know, tell you about it in the board meeting because you wouldn't want that one to linger and find out you know, after the whole community's already heard about it. I got a question. Who would be conducting the uh, use of force in the school where There could be a situation where a teacher would, or a um, special ed teacher could be a coach. I mean, it depends on the situation or where the event happens. It is a last resort and it rarely happens. Yeah. We have had teachers restrain people years ago. I know a teacher got punched in the nose long before uh, my time here, but another person that did, you know, restrain that. It's usually not an every day, <laughs> you know. We go, <laughs> that was being facetious. Rarely happens. This one kind of actually followed um, the first policy is that we do work cooperatively with other agencies. There will be occasions where CPS or police, um, not too many years ago, I know game wardens were up here doing an investigation. So it does happen. Um, we don't run interference, but we do, at all costs, try to at least contact the parent that something is going on because that can create a situation then where parents are quite resentful, you know, toward us. Um, but we do cooperate with law enforcement agencies. Um, obviously, if there is a need for law enforcement and a situation breaks out at the school, we do you know, call the police, fights, drugs, um, theft. Um, just, you know, kind of some general language that we will, you know, keep in touch with law enforcement and work cooperatively with them. Questions on that one? Do we have a deputy at work coming up to the school during the day or anything? Just um, they do them? on occasion, but mostly it's like if they're conducting a search or a special training, they don't typically just do, um, you know, pass students on a regular basis. are several for next month, so we'll read up on those, but these are the ones uh, for this month. Okay. I move that the board approve the following policies, 3226, 3246, and 4310. Second. We move and second. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Who's opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 8, new business, overnight, not very good, cross country. I move that the 
board approved the cross country overnight trip to Maryville on October 5th. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. 8B. Approved booster club activities for 2013-2014 school year. I move that the board approve the booster club activities for the 2013-14 school year. Second. Moved and seconded the discussion. Looks like it's going to be a busy one, huh? Yes. Yeah, I was going to, Marilyn, I was going to ask you one question. Last year on the fifth grade team, they had 15 kids in there. We need to split that into two teams instead of. Tim, some Tim said he'd like to close one of the zeros over the time. Yeah. 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 Okay, for the discussion. Move second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. All right, first reading of the board policies. Yeah, and these are just for awareness, I'm not going to go into all those. We are actually doing some follow up questions on a couple of these, but give them to you in advance. They may not actually even show up on the approved. Um, some of the policies we already go above and beyond, so we don't want to adopt a policy that's up to a lesser standard. Um, we're checking on the highly capable right now because the new, new standards are going into effect for next year. So you may not want to start one thing and then do another, but um, for your reading pleasure, those are here a month early. And check on those. Okay. Um, Okay, so, yep. Item D, discussion of booster club interest in batting cage at Lionsville Park. I'm um, permission. Before we do the other policy thing, mm -hmm. next next uh, month, I guess we'll be back. Um, I'd like to discuss the concept of possibly deleting reference to gender expression or identity in district policy. I know it follows the, uh, the, the linear rules, but um, we, if they tell us to jump up and down and spit quarters, I'm not going to do that either. But you know, it's impossible to not discriminate. If we have a boy who wants to be a girl and be on the girls' basketball team and join them in all kinds of activities, I'm not going to want to see us approve it, or at least not look at it completely differently than we would something else, and we'd be therefore discriminating. And then if we have a policy we can't do it, uh, it's sort of a hypocrisy. So I, I'd like to discuss it some more. I don't need to do it now. But there are a lot of policies that do make reference to that, especially the new ones um, coming out. And I did ask that question because I think I brought it up here once, but the answer to that is WIAA. They do allow gender identity, I don't know how to say this correctly, but um, a boy, for example, identifies as a girl, we allow them on the girls' program. So well, any any sport, WIA sanctions, it's got to be approved. Of course, it goes to the district, and then it goes to the WIA board up there before they approve it. So if, if a girl wanted to play on the boys, it would have to go through all the steps to get approved, whether it would or would not. I did read that somewhere on the page, WIAA, when I was looking at something else. So. Um, I think we're going to have to determine how many policies that is in, unless you just want to have a general discussion of whether or not we would believe those. Or, and it's really more wording than policy, I think, is what you're saying, right? Uh, well, I mean, it's in the policy, therefore, it, 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 it would conceivably come up, and I, I tell you, and I know that 90% of the district parents in this district would, would think, and if we ignored it, um, I mean, we just had and that it was just normal, right. I think we got trouble with it. Well, I'll do some research too on the policy <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's a very sensitive issue. Comment on this. So just, uh, just out of curiosity, kind of connected with this, if, if, um, if a girl wanted to play football, would they be able to play football even if they didn't identify themselves as a male? So. Okay, so, so they, they, could, they could play. Okay, so then my next question would be, could a boy play volleyball even though he doesn't identify himself as a 
And I guess my question is, is I mean, it's kind of going around just, the, I mean, I'm kind of just dovetailing what Art's talking about here is that there you have some discrimination, at least of what it feels like to me. Yeah. And I think it's almost impossible sometimes the way they draft these policies right. to make any kind of sense out of them because you see on the news where girls are playing football at some high school, wherever, as a kicker or whatever they are, but I mean, how many times do you see a boy saying, I don't have access to volleyball? I want to go off to college and play volleyball at UCLA. Why can't I play volleyball on the girls' team here? I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm just kind of just writing well, that. that very question in response to that identity, you know. But even if it's not identity right, even related. If it isn't. Yeah. Well, there, there's, like wrestling, now there's a girls that do wrestle on the boys' team, wrestling team. So that, that is happening already. I, I don't know how what they would say about a boy going down and the girls playing all girl volleyball team. That I would tell you. I just don't know how they arrive at some of this stuff is what I'm saying because that looks like discrimination to me if we're considering everyone equal. I don't know. I can look on the WI handbook and it's got uh, most most that in it, but that's not that section thing. on there. I'm sure I didn't dream this. I know I'm sleepy, but I know there's right. been Guys tribes over the years. That was really tribes when I was in school. There was no way. No. I don't let that happen. And there was no explanation. It just wasn't going to happen. Well, yeah, of course, one Because, see, my understanding is that the reason girls can play football is there are no football programs for girls. However, there are volleyball programs for boys. We just don't have one. So, that's. Well, I understood to be the case that well, we, have, yeah. that's our programs. we just don't have one, but we, there are no girls football programs. That's why girls can play football. Well, see, referring to your question, Chris, what if somebody was saying in Southern Montana, what's volleyball? You awful had one. That kid could go down and ask you awful to get play on that team. It'd have to be approved by the board, and then we can probably do it. It wouldn't affect their enrollment because he's only one kid. There were several that could affect the enrollment count. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on discrimination, I guess? Brandon. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I want to propose the idea for another indoor uh, batting cage down at the Lions Club Park. Um, basically, kind of the idea that we have would be um, where the tennis courts are, uh, right next to the batting cage. I don't know if you're familiar with the way the batting cage is running now. It would be running the same direction, I believe. Is that north, south, along that direction, uh, closest to the batting cage for another indoor facility. I, I don't know if anybody's seen what happens when March 1st hits and then all of a sudden there's um, however many huge increase in numbers with Little League um, and the softball, fast pitch, baseball programs, everybody converging on uh, an indoor facility somewhere to be able to, to get some work in, get some swings in, to throw the ball. Um, it's chaos, especially if you've got track in the gym, um, doing warm-ups, which takes up the better part of a half an hour um, to get things going. Uh, for us, sometimes it's, we'll be in the hallway stretching, doing uh, count statics in the hallway, um, just to try to get things rolling. Uh, There's just not enough space, um, trying to jam everything in. Uh, so I looked into it a little bit, and it looks like um, there is money out there um, for a building, for like similar building to what we have here, a pole building, um, 30 by 87, I believe I got. Uh, one bid back at 17,000, a little over 17,000, 79. Um, which 8,000 of that would be covered under the Mitch Auto Memorial. And uh, the Booster Club would pick up the remainder. So um, if it were to be approved, um, it would cost the district zero dollars um, to move forward. The, um, there is overhead, there's an overhead pole there, so if we decide to put lights or heat, the only cost basically to the district would be to build on the power. Running to it. So, it, I mean, it wouldn't be a whole lot. You're talking a couple, three hours a night during the baseball season. You know, sometimes you know, whenever we get going early. So, uh, you know, um, 
um, as far as the key control, I thought about some of the issues that might come up as far as key control. I don't know if you can put maybe John would know if there could be a key code like we have here that could be implemented down there. I don't know how, if it has to be within a certain distance of the school to be able to you know, have access to the key, that key code type of key pads so that there would be some um, People want to be running down and, and trip on keys. And then on the next thing you know, you got the whole, the whole community in there. You know, um, so we could discuss that. They did, they did go through. Um, along with that, I thought maybe a, a, a form, some, some could sign, um, you know, stating some of the safety rules, uh, things that need to be done once you enter there, the cleanliness of it, where the helmets, and da 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 da. So if somebody was allowed access, they'd have to sign off on a on form policy. Randy, would you have that so it would be they could use it even during the winter or, or certain people would have them? access, yeah. Yeah, I know you can't be there coaching your own but people and it's out of season. So you wouldn't be able to, but somebody could if you Sure, like an open uh, an open batting cage night, like they have open gym. Yeah, like a certain, certain day or certain, certain days, Monday, yeah, scheduled Fridays from seven to nine, whatever. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. It just it seems with with the numbers we're getting, um, being a little bit coach as well as a high school coach, it, it's crazy when you take twelve or thirteen or fourteen kids into a cage, and you have a couple of coaches trying to make sure everybody's not swinging, you know. And so if we had more indoor space available. Uh, you could um, have fewer kids in there at a time. It would be a lot easier to supervise those kids. So we, we, in the past, we have had some incidences where a uh, kid gets hit in the arm or a kid gets hit in the head or whatever with the bat. Um, just because the sheer numbers is too much, it's too many, it's trying to keep everybody under control. So I think it's a good idea. I think it's a safe idea. Um, and the way baseball is rolling in the community right now, it's, it's huge in popularity. Everybody, you know, what we had last year, we had a major AAA and, and two minor teams, you know, rolling through. So there's a lot of interest in baseball, softball, fast pitch. Um, and I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to, right now, this board and this administration is still in a bit of a transition period from the last superintendent and the thinking that we had. Right now, we do not have a facilities committee in place. Um, this board needs, I'm recommending that this board gets a facilities committee in place soon. We do not have an up-to-date 10-year plan that this facility should be providing to this board. Um, at one point, um, not this particular board, but this board purchased some property out here, and the idea was to get all the sports fields on campus. So I think that it would be ill-advised to, without a facilities committee, get an overall plan for what we really want to see done and where. I, even though it wouldn't cost the district any money, because if the board, or the, I should say the facilities committee, which I think should be a broad spectrum of community members, such as yourself and anybody else that would like to do that, come up with a 10-year plan as to what we would like this facility to be. Do we want to continue down here? Do we want to get it all up here where I, I think everybody would agree would be much more convenient than traveling down there? Now, don't get me wrong, I think the batting cage is a tremendous idea. I'm sure I know we need it. In fact, I would recommend a bigger building than that, actually. Um, so it's my recommendation that we push forward and try to get this facilities committee back up and running because there was a facilities committee, then it kind of got renamed as this bond committee. Some of the people that were on it kind of thought they were still on the facilities committee, but then at the time, um, the name got changed. So I think that we have some issues to solve here first and get a, a facilities committee going and come up with a 10-year plan as to what they'd like to do, make some recommendations to the board before, and this is just one board member's thinking here, before we go changing or adding facility off campus, there's a lot of things to consider. We still have the, um, uh, the BFW property. 
Uh, we still have you know, the property where the fields are now. Is it in the best interest to just have these properties sitting there as, as a district? Um, I think that there needs to be some people come together and decide what do we want to do with these properties. Do we want to sell these, use that money to, to maybe expand a notary's property behind those fields? A lady's been talked to, spoken to before about it. Um, then she was kind of, um, I don't know what happened exactly. She kind of got ticked off at the way she was approached at one point. But I do know that she probably would be receptive to making some sort of a trade. Maybe we can use property such as a BFW property or somewhere else to um, acquire more property back here and get our fields up here. You know, these are the kind of things that, you know, I think that we need to be, you know, getting looked at. And we need a committee. This board needs a facilities committee. Everything that I've been taught in the Wilder Conference is we need committees and we need to use them. Um, because it's just not, the board doesn't have a broad enough spectrum. We need more input from the community. So, but I do agree with you, we do need another batting cage. But I would, um, you know, I would recommend that we, first we get our facility committee in place. And then start looking at that. And I appreciate all the work that you've done, but I really, um, and this could happen before spring. It really could. If we get a facilities committee in place, and get busy and get a you know a 10-year plan as to what they would like to see and make re recommendations to the board. Just one board member's thoughts. I'd, I'd love to hear the rest of your thoughts. Well, one thing the property down there by the cemetery was, was already appraised, and the cemetery would like to buy it for a uh, parking area. Yeah. So that was already done, and they had they had the cemetery committee did come to the board. Talk to them about purchasing that. Yeah. We need to make it's only a narrow strip. Yeah, it's a narrow strip. It serves this, this district no purpose whatsoever. So, those are the kind of things that I think that we need to be looking at and seeing if, you know, do we really want to continue off campus or are we better served to, to move stuff on campus? Just food for thought. So, well, one thing that if you put a field up there, you're going to have to make sure that the girls and boys are not too far from a different distance because when you get into that, like Vancouver got in at their tennis court one was the boys are close to the girls, so the guys come in, the people come in, the so it costs them to put another tennis court in alongside so they get equal. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, so we, we would need to be laid out and designed properly. Yeah. Yeah. We did buy a, a piece of property back there and uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was. I'm pretty sure I was on the board at that time. Um, and so, you know, the other problem was is we needed another piece of property back there to, to have enough room to have two fields, maybe what back to back or whatever, however that would happen. And I'm sure that as a coach, that would be much more convenient. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see if you put it here. I yeah. just, the scuttle button on the street is that she was ticked off. Like you said, yeah. maybe, you know, a little bit or whatever type deal and said, forget. Yeah, I'm not selling. And then I'm like, well, if that's the way she stands and if she's as stubborn as what I hear she is, then. Well, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's, she, I, you know, I'm also told that she does arts and crafts and stuff. And maybe she'd really like to have a little piece of property right beside Oki's there. Put her little arts and crafts shop up. I don't know. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe there's ways to work around that. You know, we, we need to take a little different approach, I think, rather than. You know, trying to play hardball with some poor little old lady that, yeah. no, whether she's poor or not. <laughs> right. I mean, but are you talking about the carpet that's just by the baseball field there? Oh, yeah, kind of behind it back there. Like center field, basically, I think is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah, we would need more room back there in order to. When do you look at that on um, maps, after most of that property is across the road. Uh, across the road? Mm -hmm. Her, her property, property, most of her property is across the road. You bought well, that land from Greg Fiddle. All that uh, park and all that. Yeah. I I haven't I haven't looked at it. All I know is that we we bought property with that intent. And, you know, so the district okay. has that investment. It would be nice to try and move forward in my opinion. Since we did invest in land, it's not doing us any good right now as a district. Maybe you said maybe facilities committee would be able to come in and look at the lands there and get some of the end to be able to 
professional go, yeah, there's enough land here, you can put fields like this, or yeah. there's not enough land, you need to, you know. And that would be. Sweat, so there's a whole yeah. thing that, you know. Yeah. That would be, you know, something that needs to be looked at. But, but we, we, we need a facilities committee in place. You know, it's basically disbanded at this, at this point. And so. If, if I remember right, when Alan met up like that and talked to, see, I guess I already owned some land right there. And he said it wasn't big enough the way that the land, what, what we got, we needed additional land to put a baseball field. If I remember right, no, I'm not going to say it. Guarantee on that, but you got well, to ask Alan, he might remember. Yeah, and I haven't looked at that map specifically to know who owns what. All I know is that I was that I know that we purchased land once already and that there is enough land back there if we just can figure out how we can get it. Mm -hmm. Ed, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Tom? <clears throat> By the time you organize a facility committee and establish a 10-year plan, it could be years. Well, once again, uh, I was just wondering if you could have a separate committee just to focus on that one mm -hmm. particular agenda there and kind of streamline it. Possibly, yeah. But I really I, I, I really think that we need to do a facilities committee back. No, you're looking at you're looking at it could be a long time. And that's fine. I mean it doesn't you, you know we can we can work on a long range plan. It doesn't have to be done in you know a month. You can nice you can be three spring. years out and work on five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten down the road. You know, what's important right now, we need to get those things addressed first. Well, yes, Hollis? <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, Brad, do you have a timeline right now? Or, I mean, has there been a timeline looked at when we actually want to complete this building? Or? Well, I mean, no, I haven't looked at a timeline just basically because I wanted to put the idea forth, you know, in front of the board and find out even if it is possible. Um, it's, it's not, I don't know if, if volunteer, if we could use volunteer help, but I've talked to some community members and everybody seems pretty young, well, like, show me the hammer and the saw and let's go, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it'd be a huge deal. Matter of fact, I think you could probably have it constructed and up and with all the help in you know, a month easy. Oh, you yeah. know, in the summertime, let's spare hands. So I, I didn't look into um, when, the sooner the better, obviously. Mm -hmm. I, I think you should go ahead and do it. And, but because you know, if you put a field in here, you're going to have to take time to clear the land, fix it up, and be able to play on it. You think going to just do that overnight? That's going to be at least a couple of years at the moment. And if you've got your batting stuff, equipment in the building, and if you just do the stop, then you can take your batting equipment and move it to another building if you want to do it or need to do it. Have there been any discussion with the county as far as permitting and designated contractor to do it. I don't know if you have a contractor license or mm, I don't. hold this to as far as, you know, specs and standards. And they would have to be, yeah, they'd have to be permit. Um, okay. A building permit. And it would have to be engineered as far as an actual licensed contractor that came in. Um, I do know some, I don't know if it just would mean that they would have to be there. Right. And everybody else could help, you know, you know what I mean? There's also, there are ways around. there's also a liability issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know that just being a public school, it, it could be a little different than just putting a building up on the well, I think the sooner we get at it, the better. Yeah. Uh, I think the sooner we get a facilities committee in place, the better too. Yeah. So, so was one of the ideas then getting everything up here, I heard that language of getting everything up here, does that include, uh, does that include a facility for Little League? on top of just the school sponsored sports because Little League is, is, is separate. Yeah. And, and, I, and I say that in respect to a lot of the pressure Randy's talking about on the current facility is four grades of kids, 50 plus kids every spring playing baseball. And they're trying to get into this facility when two varsity programs are trying to use the facility right after school too. So I guess, I, I mean, thinking kind of open-mindedly here, if you keep the Okies Little League Park and you still have the batting cage down there, that batting cage could frankly be multi-use also for the school, for the high school if needed, but also support the Little League program that's down there as well planned. 
and girls and, sophomore. And then you have and then you have kind of business as usual for the high school programs up here in this facility. And right after school, you've got the field and the facility down there for the little league program. I mean, you could structure it however you wanted to, but I'm just saying I think that there would be some viable use for it, you know, sooner than later. So I mean, I would support that too. I think that the you know the whole park down there is going to have to be a discussion at some point at the board level as to whether we want to keep that liability or you know, providing a, basically a community park. Well, put it on the next agenda. I mean, at some point we're going to have to address that issue because it's been dropped back in our lap, basically, from the uh, plans plug and Yes, we have. Do we actually own that property? We do. We have the title to declare that's where the school was. How many years ago, here? It was there when I graduated up there in 57. Okay. And you mentioned about a batting cage so down there now. That's an old one. They're not a functioning batting cage there now, is there? No, it gets pretty much destroyed every year from kids hanging on the nets. I'm just seeing kind of a netting the area, but not actually an enclosed metal shed. Yeah, there's a wood building there with um, power to it that you, if everything was in place, you could essentially have a batting machine in there, pitch machine in there to. Was there one at one time? There was. It, yeah, it was functioning. And then um, that's why I think also if you had an enclosed space, it, it's going to keep a lot of that right. off of your equipment. Right yeah. now it's just out there for kids just to find. Just meshing everything. Yeah. You know, I've been out there a few times looking, you know, at the camp kids and stuff. And yeah. They've been demonstrating the bar fest. And, and we do have a commitment, at least verbal, from the youth camp to do maintenance out there. And so, if you've ever noticed the barbed chips out there, the tallest ceiling probably, and that's been spread probably six hours. So they're willing to do other work, but it's not just going to be when we say, you know, it's like when they can get out there on their terms and their conditions. And so it's not like we brought our own work, but we just met for it. Okay, well. Um, I don't know where you want to move forward with this too, but I mean I know that that is a great idea and I know that we need it. So it's just a matter of um, you know, what the board would like to do about that, if anything, at this point, or if you want to bring it back to the board later, or, or what do you think? Well, mostly, I mean, to me this was informational because I don't know that this had ever been even talked about at right. this level before. It was news to me, but that doesn't mean you guys didn't know about it in some other meeting or conversation. So I thought the important thing was to just you know, get it out there, not not as an action item, because I don't think we were ready for an action item, but I'll take direction for where we want to go next month, a month after, six months. To have a 10-year facility plan, I do think isn't going to happen in a month. I mean, we're going to have to be looking over the properties, getting assessment, talking to the county. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and even at once a month meeting, I mean, it's, we have to meet every day for. It takes a lot of work, takes a lot of dedication to put something like that together for sure. But it does say in the policies and procedures that we will have a 10 year plan in place by a facilities committee. So if we're going to follow the policies and procedures. We probably either need to do that or change that one other. So. I'm going to have a hard time getting anybody on the facilities committee after the last debacle with Kayakum County. You know, it's uh, a lot of people are pretty upset still. There's well, a lot of raw wounds. Well, but we have to involve the community to get you know more community input. Um, there's a lot of wounds, and the more people you get involved in that, the more hopefully they will understand those needs. And I think the facilities committee has taken on different you know, roles based on what it was. I mean, we had the group that was kind of a long-standing uh, oversight committee, then it kind of got labeled the facilities committee, but it was more of the bond committee, and so there was some blurring of lines and, you know, um, I guess confusion, and some people got off and some people got on, and then I've been requesting, go ahead, I think you have something else. There isn't any money in the facilities anyway. Correct? I have no idea. I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, there's, 
even there isn't. I mean, they're talking about a project that they're willing to fund for nothing. And as far as I know, there isn't any money in the, for the facilities committee. They can plan all they want, but they can't execute. Right. So maybe it's your chest, but they can't. Yeah. I mean, we might, I, my, why don't we just make this separate and have it put this on an agenda item to discuss the Lions Club next meeting and just kind of. I think that it. it's extremely ill-advised to be just building helter skelter without, We're not some building. Of, without, without some sort of a plan by a facilities committee. You know, my thoughts only. I mean, that's up to the board to make that decision. We can make the decision to put that building up tonight if we'd like to. I don't have a problem. I'm just saying we need to get a facilities committee in place soon. The board needs to be taking recommendations from a committee. It's going to move at a snail's pace. Well, that's fine. It doesn't have to move. It's not fast. fine because they're going to need that. They need a, a second vacuum. Well, I'm not talking about that particular issue. I'm just saying that we, you know, as a board, we need to be careful in, you know, not using committees. You know, that's basically laws to one on one. Probably the first thing I learned: get committees in place and use them. It's the best thing, the smartest thing the board can do. Because it, it, it encompasses more of the community. It gets people in the communities that feel like they have, you know, an ownership in the school. Rather than the separation that we just dealt with in the last bond debacle, where there was so much separation that we, you know, we were doomed right from the start. Except we you listen to the, the people. We did listen to the committee, though. There was a committee. Well, so... <laughs> It was kind of the exception maybe there, but yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a it was a committee all right. I'll say that. The one thing that bothers me is why is the board doing making the decision when they're not putting any money out? Not the only thing that they own is the strip of land and putting the building on. Because it's facilities on on district land. That's why the board has to make that decision. And the district will have And I can get the policy book if you'd like to read it. I mean, the that's a board decision. Be in charge of the I decision. believe it's in the 6900 yes. area. I was just looking at it before the meeting, actually. And that, that's where you got to figure out, the, you know, yes, we may not pay for the building, but there will be key control, insurance, the ESD will be involved in the risk management. Uh, they already are, to a certain extent. I mean, they come out and do checks on the park and send you little notes, and you should do this, and oh, thank you for doing that. And they, you know, every time the lady comes down here, she swings out there and snaps a few pictures, and so far she's happy. But, um, you know, not that that's a bad thing, but if we do the batting cage and then say, well, now we want to sell that property because we're doing something else, and then you're, then it's pretty entangled. And so, you know, I agree with the long range planning. Also the need. Well, there's, there's really, there wouldn't be no rush for it, really, it's just one dimension of it, it can't do it. No, I mean, I know. It, I'm just trying to see in the future, I know it's great. Last year was a little bit chaotic with the amount of numbers we had, and okay. behind those processes, they just keep coming. The, the interest is there, and so I want to solve the, the problem of safety and be able to have the little leaders in an area where they aren't crammed in one space. Well, I, I agree with what Chris said with, it, with the high school and, and the girls and everybody trying to get into the batting cage with this one and just ain't doing it because a lot of kids are, you can see it, the ones that have spent time in the batting cage will see the difference of able to play it. And it would make a lot of difference for the kids that are coming up. I would like to know, you know, Willoughby County, approve this, who will they require to build it, what do they require as far as, you know, engineer design, because, you know, how much money, what if it's 50000 or 40000 I mean, is the booster club then going to make up, pay that much more? I mean, sometimes the county is very um, strict on their rules, and I wouldn't want to, you know, support anything necessarily until I had answers to those questions, which could probably be pretty easily um, yeah, that could be dug into. Well, that's what my next recommendation was that you go down and talk to uh, Tim Gross. Is that who that I'm talking to? Tim Gross. And see what his input. 
I'm see what he's got to say. What's what the requirements? Yeah, that's something I had to be willing to do. Uh, I, I could be I could be wrong, but I think the schools actually don't have to do that. I would guess. I mean, if we appoint Randy to, to do that, then that probably would happen all right. But I think it needs to have to be a school official, actually. I'd be glad to talk to him about it. Yeah, if I were or personally. Yeah. 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 So you want to move forward on the permitting process and see what that's going to entail? Is that what? I think there is a little more information. Yeah, Maybe some more bids. Anyway. And uh, just kind of see what, what's going to transpire. Sure. See if actually volunteer um, <coughs> workers can, yeah, can work on that. I, I'm thinking they probably can. Um, I know that the football field is put in, so you can probably speak to that with a lot of volunteer work. So I'm assuming that it can be. Well, just as a coach, I mean, I appreciate everybody the support and the thoughts and allowing him to move forward and ask some of these questions. You know, I'm not just going to draw a line right now. So thanks for that. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay. Um, let's see now. Let's go ahead and get this last motion done. All right. Then I think we'll open it up to the classification discussion a little bit. So let's move on to. Uh, Nine E approved, approved bus. I need to speak. Approved purchase of new Thomas school bus. I move that the board approve the purchase of a new 78 passenger Thomas school bus. <laughs> that's a good twist, or is it just me? Well, I, when I say that's like the little red engine. Yeah. All right, Thomas. All right. Move to the second. Second. Move to second in discussion. Yeah, is this a general depreciation rotation? It's part of the rotation schedule. Uh, we got the funds in there and everything. Yep. It's new. Ready to spend them. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. We want to do the 1B, 2B as part of the superintendent's report. Oh, we can do that. We can do that, John. Go ahead. No, we'll skip around. Okay, all right. We'll just... Get everybody out of the here. All right. Okay. All right. So, business office report, the end of the fiscal year, August 31st. Um, now, on paper, it shows us ending with six sum of $622,000 cash reserves. Um, however, uh, in reality, it's about $132,000 short of that. And the reason is, is because there was a timber sale in August, uh, late August, before OSPI could take the money back. So remember, we get timber dollars two different ways. We get it in the general fund if we have levy in place, which OSPI will take back. You don't get it. And you get it in the debt service fund if you have a bond in place. Now, we did miss out on the $80,000, then I have the bond in place. And uh, that's just money that we won't get. It was just first to other schools. Um, I could have paid for somebody's salary that got moved out of here. Actually, it couldn't have. It could only be used for capital projects. So. <laughs> Same point. Um, so, I talked to OSPI last week, and they'll be taking that $132,000 back in January. Um, I said, well, could you take that sooner? Sooner? I said, no, nope, January. That's true. Yeah. So, at least we don't interest on We're going to bank account. Um, so yeah, we, really, we ended the year at almost $500,000. Um, well, that's going to stretch that a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so CBA, um, currently we're over 230 students in CBA. We added a, another teacher, Mr. McNulty. Um, I think about the first or second day of school. Uh, uh, actually, before. Yeah, okay. And uh, he's already full. So we actually just posted another teacher uh, because there's more students that are, that are waiting to, to be assigned. Um, so I can see us easily hitting 300 plus students here by December. And CBA has told us it can even go higher if we have capacity. So um, 
That's good news. Um, on the enrollment front here in this building, uh, currently, as of the September count, we are uh, about 23 students over budget. So I, I budgeted pretty conservatively at, at 255 or at 278 FTE as of September, and that number has gone up since September. Um, so in, enrollment, this is the first time in several years that enrollment has been way up over budget. So um, that's good news. Um, <coughs> where was the where was that recognized? In K through 12, most in elementary or middle school or various grades. It's yeah. yeah. It's K through K through eight. Yeah. Except for uh, eighth grade, which only has 14 kids. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, but yeah, mostly elementary. Um, I would say, and there's a couple in high school, but mostly uh, elementary. Um, so that's good. That's good news. I think that's it for for that. You said you want me to do the scores now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we didn't get scores back um, in high school. And I made a little uh, <clears throat> summary of the scores. It's pretty simple to, to read. Um, EOC is end of course exam. And we're required to give those after algebra one. And in the past, it's been after algebra two or geometry. And here's an integrated test. And you can see there's different grade levels that take that test. We have eighth graders that, that take algebra, and after they complete algebra, they take the test. Now, it is a graduation requirement, and so you can see that we have kids clear up to the 11th grade still taking that test, but pass it. And so, really nice results. I don't, I don't know if you saw the, the uh, article in the Observer the other night, but Mesa High School clearly had better results than any other school in that article including the Pacific County. Uh, if we scroll down to the EOC year two, so this would be after taking algebra two, um, but it's integrated and so it includes geometry since we don't actually have a geometry class, it's an integrated test. And the one thing I wanted to point out here, besides uh, you know, a couple hundred percents there, this is biology one. This is EOC year two. I'll get the biology in just a second. Oh, okay. But actually, the same for biology. Look at the number of level fours, which, which is the highest level you can achieve on that test. I'm amazed. You know, look at those 10th grade scores. Of the 14 kids that took the test, 12 of them scored at a level four. That's incredible. Um, you know, all of them passed it, as you can see. But, but that's incredible uh, an achievement. And if you look at the biology EOC, always also a state uh, graduation requirement. Same thing. Um, you know, we had 20 people take the test as 10th graders. 14 of them passed at a level four. That, that's just really, really good. Um, so I'm very proud of those scores, I and mean, so are the teachers. I mean, they're, they're doing a great job with that. Just scroll down a little bit further. Um, we'll show our uh, high school proficiency exam for reading and writing. Um, 10th graders take that. Take that test first, and then if you don't pass it, you can take it again as 11th grader. Um, but again, 12 level fours, you know, 90% overall passing grade in 10th grade. Um, really good. And then writing as well, 95% uh, passes 10th graders uh, for our writing exam. Um, so overall, very good scores. Teachers doing a great job, but not only that, but the students. Um, I have to commend the students for working hard. And, taking this seriously, so um, I'm proud to present those scores to you for high school. Very good. Thanks for that time. Yeah. Are those tests available to see? We get to see those? No, they're secure materials. The teachers technically can't even see them. Well, <laughs> can we get to see, like two years ago, what they look like? You, you can go to OSPI's website at k12.us and you can download sample test items that uh, actually were items that had been discarded from previous years. And so you can't get an idea of what they look like. But as far as the actual test, there's very strict guidelines of who actually gets to see those tests besides the kids. What were the thoughts of the, of the uh, students? I mean, what did they think that they were tough tests? I mean, what, what was their general feeling, especially when they got fours? It, you know, it varies. 
usually what I hear is, oh boy, Mr. Chairman, we failed that test. You know, we didn't do well. When they do, fine. Um, so it, it just really depends. But, so these you aren't great on a curve, are you? No, no. No. The one thing they do, uh, the state does, is they, they do range finding. And so it's not really a curve, but they do adjust kind of the range of the scores. And you know, range it's, range. Yeah, it's statistics. So it's not, uh, yeah. there is some statistics involved, yes. Um, I mean, but relatively, we're still in, in better shape than others. It just doesn't mean that we're absolutely there. Correct. There's always room for improvement. Yeah. But I'd rather be in our condition than oh, yeah, some other sure. service. <laughs> Anything else for John? All right. Karen? I guess, I guess. Mm -hmm. Those timber dollars now, is that, that's for this year, can we expect another similar uh, occurrence next year? I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball. It just depends on the timber sales. Um, you know, that was the first significant loss. And you saw the email I sent to you. You know, Shelly sent it, so I don't need to open old wounds, but you lost out. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, I mean, it just depends on the logging that happens on, on those state lands, you know. Some people say that the Marble Marlette has a shut down. Well, there was a huge sale in August, so, I mean, who knows? I don't, I don't know. I mean, there were people that didn't think that that was true, wasn't it? Wasn't there? On the bond? Like, that was a fallacy? That they, you know, they, they oh, no, it can't be serious, we're going to lose 80000 or whatever from the timber dollars, and now it's occurring. I, yep, I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John went to great lengths to show. Yeah, I know. That. I know. Yeah. Anyway, it is what it is. Yep, it but, is. But I just want to do the the ending reserve for the general fund isn't as high as it looks. And I wanted to explain that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks. Okay, Gary. Okay, you can go first. So <coughs> as John mentioned, um, our enrollment is up. They, we ended um, in June with a count of 279. That was a head count. And we are up a couple from the September enrollment report. We added a new kindergartner and a seventh grader. So we are now at 295 head count. And we ended in June with a 263 FTE and we are at 279.5 because of kindergartners. So our numbers are up, and they are, we have, um, out of the 15, 12 of them are um, K group 8, and then 3 in the ninth grade, so we do have some impression. And we do have um, two very large classes, and I had mentioned that, kindergarten and first grade. So kindergarten is now up to 31, and as is um, first grade, but we have addressed um, the um, issue of the large classes by putting um, instructional assistants in there for the morning half because the afternoon when the students go to Mandarin out of the 31 um, first graders or kindergartners, excuse me, out of 31 kindergartners, we have um, um, 17 of them in, in Mandarin, so 14 of them in the, in the English class and then out of 31 first graders, we have um, 20 in the English, so there are 11 in the English class. So in the morning, we have as many as four adults in the first grade class and three in the kindergarten at the times when they're teaching the um, core academic content areas of, of reading. So that's been very beneficial um, to them. Mandarin just began. Um, last week, so Monday, um, last Monday, a week ago, was their first opportunity. So the two teachers, um, Tina, Miss Tina, and Lynn, were observing um, the other teachers, and then the students um, were, um, you know, getting the familiarity of, of being in the classroom um, in English before they transitioned over to the Mandarin. So. Um, They've had one week now, and this is their second week in Denver. Okay, I want to let you know that every period 
in the gym is utilized for PE classes. John mentioned Sean McNulty um, is here. So he is teaching kindergarten PE for second, third, fourth. And then we have Bob Dalton and uh, Bruce Hickman teaching the other PE classes. The only period in which we are unable to have PE is actually fourth period 11 to 11.50 because that is the elementary recess time. So we can't put kids in there at that time. So that's the only slot and we definitely could use a few more um, spaces for PE because we just don't have enough. So we're kind of juggling, we really juggle in an effort to serve all classrooms. Um, but we managed to do it. Um, one class is having to um, utilize a classroom. Actually, it's the fourth grade for morning recess because what we've done this year, which has really worked out well, is gone to a grade appropriate recess. We used to have one through five. And what we discovered, and we talked about this, but how, what, was, what were the logistics? How were we going to manage this? Um, because of the space issue, um, we went to two lunches now. So we have a um, K5 lunch and then a 6 12 lunch, which um, gave us more space or time for recesses and utilizing in the gym. So we have the kindergarten, first, second, third recess, and we have a four or five recess. So four and five will go to recess before lunch, and then they have lunch, and then K123 eat lunch, and then they go to recess. So it's kind of flipped, but they eat at the same time. So while first, second, third are eating, or they think they're having a recess, then they come in and eat, and they go right back to class, and the first and third graders go off the recess. And it's worked out really, really well. We've had less issues out on the playground because first graders and, quite frankly, fifth graders, um, that's a huge age difference. So we've managed to, to do that this year. Um, okay. Amanda. So we have 17 kindergartners and 20 in the um, first grade class. And we have a video, YouTube video here that um, John actually put on there um, when they videoed for us. But I just want you to see what happened in four days. So they began last Monday, and on Friday last, Marilyn to come in and video. Um, it was the first grade class that we were in. And right from the get-go um, on Monday, I said, I need to know a couple of words. Teach me two words. One of them is, um, Stop or no, and that's Bushin. Yeah. And the other one is Team um, Shore, which means listen to teacher. So if you watch this video, you're going to um, hear, uh, watch the kids, and they will recite with the teacher, and what they're saying is, I listen to teacher, um, I will watch teacher, and then they're going to um, count for you. So it's, it's amazing the enthusiasm um, and the engagement level that's here. So. Finish? Mm -hmm. Not sure I'll get back to the regular part once this happens. It <laughs> worked earlier, but that does not mean it will work.
So that was four days, because Monday was more of an orientation day. That by Friday um, at noon, when they went in for class, and that would be three days worth of, of meetings, um, that's what they were going to do. I have a question, Karen. How many, did we get any kids out of state from that story that comes in with them? Two or two? Two. Uh, and the only thing I don't think I'm like, disappointed in them. The rest of the board did go to open house, and I got to talk to both of them and enjoy talking with them. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to come in and, and see, and not just that, both classes, but the other classes, um, that, and to see it um, first hand. You know, it's, it's very impressive. Mm -hmm. and, and you'd be impressed with um, the, the number of kids in the kindergarten and first grade classes with the 31 um, students and those teachers as well, I really don't know, because I have my job working with those members. It was funny today, even the non mandarin kids were coming down and they were talking Chinese and all that. <laughs> when I told them I was from the board, they, they looked at me and said, what's the board? <laughs> they, they don't have that in China. And the superintendent does everything, he says everything. And my I son told me that. Teachers asking me if um, uh, Tina and Lynn would come into their classrooms because their children are coming back saying, we want to learn Chinese. So, well, that was my question. How many kids actually are showing more interest in this? And will we, if they can convince their parents to make this a little even more successful? That's what I'm hoping. So, um, tomorrow, you have any questions about the. Mm -hmm. the yeah. um, so, and then tomorrow we have an exam today, so we will be working on. Goals, teachers will be goal setting for the year. Okay. Camp Rise. Um, Roman is not up. Um, started at 78. Uh, JRA promised us 76. And that's kind of how the teacher exchange happened. We had an opening, and I talked to Sean about it. He's been wanting to come up. And and work up here, especially with the PE program. And so since our home had dropped and there was a need up here, he said he would like to come up. So um, we made a move there. Um, that's what the transfer was. We did get the security and system, system installed. We talked about, I think it was two meetings ago, and we've already used it, so come in handy. Um, and move on to the next part. We did have a, for our teacher gathering when before school starts, we always do some mandatory in-service. This year we decided to invite retirees who had been here before. And we had 19 of them show up. It was really fun to yeah, meet lunch with them. Um, Lyle Patterson came, Dean Carter, you know, people came as far as Vancouver, Longview, uh, several local people. Uh, one person barely worked a lot, said, I don't know how you planned this, but this is 50 years ago to the day I first started this um, building, and so it was, it was a, a good couple hours while we ate lunch. That was fun. Um, I've already talked about it in a moment. I'm going to give you a little more specific information. I'll just give you a general number. Uh, so we've been off to an excellent start. There's a lot of enthusiasm. I think you just saw some of it in that last clip. Um, it's nice to have some different cultures in the building. Or, you know, or learning words as we go down the hall, even the adults. And so it's been very good. Um, we do have an important meeting coming up. Um, once again, we will have to make a decision on whether or not to opt up into the 2B classification. And I'll give a little more details about that. Um, that you can put on your calendars. The meeting will be September 30th at 6.30. Right in the comments out there. And so the way this works, um, and again, this is, this is going to be general information. We will have information specifically at the October 4 meeting this meeting but so we are by definition of 1B school we have been opting up and playing 2B schools so by November 8th that's the initial declaration schools have to turn in a, a declaration to opt up if you do nothing you will stay at the classification where you I would say I guess technically belong enrollment wise now there's been a lot of discussion and Russ Hickman, our athletic director, has been to some meetings and some people say they're going to do one thing and then the next week they say they're going to do another thing. So 
I don't know if it's posturing, jockeying, or just not knowing really what the best decision will be. A couple things we're doing internally. Uh, Russ has a survey. He's going to survey the kids. We're going to get input from this community meeting. He's got some um, specific numbers he will share. He did come to a board meeting, I want to say May, maybe, and presented some numbers. And if I recall that, I think at that time he said our top three grades. And they, 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 used to, they used to count 10, 11, 12, but it was kind of pointless to count the seniors because they won't really count that determines what the next year looks like. So I think it was 9, 11, 12, was like 75 or something. I don't even have that in front of you. But, um, so you have to do your initial declaration if, or lack thereof by November 8th. There is going to be another window where you can essentially change your mind. Um, a couple of the significant pieces are if you are one B, you must play eight man football. We used to have a thing where you could do, you know, eleven men to do some other things. And so I don't want to put out misinformation because we're still in the process of gathering that information. But another kind of significant thing that was mentioned is there's some really what we would consider big schools who now may be dropping down into the 2B, like the Montesano, for example, who's kind of been a powerhouse at least at some, some level of sports. Uh, a lot of the 1B schools don't have JV programs. Some of our programs are getting low numbers, and we may not have JV. Some of the 1B uh, facilities aren't as nice as 2B facilities. There's travel. Um, concern. So, I mean, there's a whole plethora of uh, issues, and that's why we just want to open it up to the community, uh, not exclude, and get the information. Gilbert's going to be having some information here in a week or so. Russ has, has um, there will be another meeting he goes to after this 30th date, but before the board meeting. So, we do plan to bring a recommendation in October because there isn't time to do it at the November meeting because you have to do your declaration by November 8th. And so, um, it's a, a two-year window, but I think there was talk about making it a three-year, but I don't think that ever got through. Well, next, next year, the calendar, this next calendar, is, it's 8, 9, 10, and 11. They moved it back because they said that too many kids are 12 years grade 12 are already out, so they don't affect their count. They won't have the actual count. So the count now is moved up 8, 9, 10, and that one. So that's what you got to count your enrollment order. So it's going to be four grades now instead of three? How's that? It's going to be four grades? Yeah, you, you count as four grades. Is what oh, you do. So your equated enrollment, that's what they figure when you're playing the next year, that's what your enrollment's going to be. School year. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I misspoke anything, maybe you guys had anything. I heard it was 9, 10, 11. That's so. what I thought it was 9, 10, 11. Yeah. Yeah. Would, you, would you explain an independent status? Because that, that, that's a third option. Yeah, that I can't explain too much about. There's so many factors involved in that, whether it's independent and which way and what sport. and uh, what, what? I don't even want to go there because I'll probably misspeak on something. Um, we weren't really prepared to go into the whole thing tonight, and so there are there are a ton of options. There's been schools talking about doing that. Um, well, they, yeah. if we this we is the it should it should go and say independent, very independent, and then you play you can play anybody you want to play that will play. You. But the end of your season, you go into the tournament, whatever bracket you are, whether you want to be to be or whatever. That's what you. If we stayed at two B, we would just have to like to stay in the league. We wouldn't change that because. But if we went only one, one B, then we could go as an independent and we could play anybody, whoever we get, and then you still got a chance to play into a tournament. Yeah, one of the concerns with that though was when they take the independents. <coughs> see, now there's some kind of. I don't know how you want to say it, but an eighth place team would usually play like a, a first place. So the higher seeds play the lower ranked teams. 
But there was some discussion that if you're independent, they might just dump you into a hat and you might draw out uh, number one versus number two and you eliminate one of your top teams because they drew a number one. So we need the people here that you know have been studying this for the last couple of months. But my, my intent really was go to that meeting if you can. Mm -hmm. um, and then there will be those facts at the uh, October board meeting. Oh, well, I, well, I'm just kidding. And I, I might be wrong on this, but the teams like they operate in uh, upper, toward Vancouver now. The, like the first and second place team wouldn't be playing, but the lower teams would play to see if they would be available. How many, it depends on how many team tournaments they're going to have, but how many is going to be available. See, like you've got now, you've got Canal. You got Oakville, you got Mary, Mary Knight, you got uh, North River, and Wichita, which have all gone into town. So you you would play, you could play them, or you could play uh, uh, somebody else, not knowing who that would be. And the district, but uh, last year I talked to the Oakland Independent, they ended up playing a Christian team in Vancouver, came to Aberdeen, they played. Side. Well, if you're independent, can you still play 11 man football and well, be 1B? Well, what there's, what you can do now, this is, the committee is looking at doing this. This was discussed at the WIA and it was discussed at, at the district meeting about having the school take an opt up one sport and then you can play in that sport like if you want to opt up to 11 man football. Now, that hasn't been decided yet. But there are there's several other things that are going on. Number one, there's a committee that's looking at the private school, public school, the difference of what's going on. And they may take and put them into a separate bracket. That, and they, then if they do that, because there is about 40 or 50 private schools, then you have a, a change instead of one B, two B, you would have a B two team. And now, last March or April, when we had our meeting with the WI director, the center superintendent and one of the board members come, there is people in the, going statewide to go back to a 16-team tournament for the 1B, the 2Bs, and the 1As. But if they consolidate the, make the private school go one tournament, then, then it would be just Bs and the 1As. But see, that's still not decided. When this shapes up a little more, I will get you something as soon as I can because right now it's more confusion than answer. Uh, but we, we do need to make a decision at the October meeting, so if press something uh, we'll do before that, and I'll get it out to you as soon as I can. Is, is it possible Russ's information might be available before that meeting so that you can come prepared with questions that you might have to before make better use of? Huh? Before the 30th? Well, yeah, I mean, even if it, I don't know if it's feasible to post he it to the website, or like even just a bullet point of items that he'll be speaking to rather right. than a full born Yeah, I, I will talk that. to him. Um, yeah, because it's, I mean, I mean it's a new scenario, and the teams like Valley that said they were going to do one thing and now switched and done another thing, and so it's a little cat and mouse trying to figure out what everyone else is going to do to see if you could have your own league here. Because there are a lot of 1B schools in our area. But because of the traditional rivalries or this or that, I've done one thing, and now that we're going to do another. Uh, well, you take right now, there's, there's besides Morris, you know, I'm talking about uh, Rainier coming down, I'm talking about Toledo coming down. These are all powerhouses coming down, from 1A coming down to B. And uh, if you stay to B, I guarantee you that one chance out of a thousand that you might make it to state. Because you're going to get beat out of these big powerhouses that have been in the NDA, which you've shown in the year, like almost anyone. So, what, I, what I'll hear probably in some degree, what's going on, they'll talk about it at the district board meeting, I'm sure. And I'll try to bring that to the meeting where we had a, um, a September. And that clarification, that's a three year commitment? Because I heard last time I thought I understood that it was a two year commitment. I've been hearing recently that it's now changing to a four-year commitment. Well, they voted on that and voted it down. To what? 
for it, it stays at two years. It's, it's going to stay at two? Yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's what was voted last year. Four years is a long time. No, I know. Yeah. Right. I can support a two-year. Yeah. Right. Two I don't know. Who was proposing two years. four? Times that was uh, yeah. the big, the WI director of the board doing that. I see. They, they said it's too much change. They don't like to pay more. So they want to mm -hmm. just make an excuse for it. No, it's not a problem. <laughs> The reason we got the one B, two B to the tournament is because the one year, a couple of years ago, one uh, B lost about forty some thousand in the Akbon, and I think the WI director was worried about losing his salary because he gets a hundred seventy six thousand dollar salary. He gets more, makes more money than the governor. Well, of course, what do you expect? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Tell you, funny thing is, Oregon's WI director gets only 128. Wow. Well, people, yeah. So, a couple of people have asked, you know, when does the new board take over? And uh, this RCW, you know, I still don't give you a specific, but it says the next board meeting after the results are certified. Well, it doesn't usually take too long to certify the results, but. Most likely that would be the December 17th meeting. So I would ask you to put that out. I don't remember who at the moment. That's all for me. Okay. Any questions for Lisa? Do you know when the filing date is? No. Well, yeah, you, know, you know, 
because you have to do a certain amount of maintenance. The chips are all spread now. You know, most people aren't going to trip over a week. There may be something prohibitive that we're not aware of, which would just, right. just say, you know, okay, we can't do it online. So if any other hand, it may, something may emerge that you know, makes it look very attractive. Yeah. 